So I just want to dive in. We don't have super a lot of time together today. Um, I'll start out just by um, kind of expanding a little bit on my introduction. Um, so I started my information security career in 2005, leading information security teams at eBay and Zynga. These were super cool places to be working in information security and risk management. In both cases, we were running online operations 24 by seven with millions of simultaneous users daily. eBay had an uptime requirement of 99.94% and as one of the first major electronic commerce shops enabled strangers to transact with each other over the internet. Zynga was growing incredibly rapidly as an early adopter of Amazon AWS. In 2009, the Zynga game Farmville launched and in just a few weeks, the game went from zero to 10 million daily active users. A few months later, it rose to 80 million daily active users. And now at Cobalt, we build security software and provide pen testing as a service. Like many DevOps companies, we are data-driven in every aspect of our business, from product to engineering, to marketing, to finance, our business is run by the numbers. I am thrilled to be here with you today to share some of my stories and insights from the past decade or so of being obsessed with information and risk. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about my journey exploring and creating security metrics from eBay's global information security team to authoring a book with McGraw-Hill to conducting dozens of BSIM assessments to our latest research project at Cobalt, the State of Pen Testing 2021, which features data and insights from over 1,600 pen tests during 2020. I'll also talk about, if there's time, why I think the information security industry is due for a new model when it comes to thinking about information technology, people, and process. I'll share a few insights about different challenges I've observed and encountered when using security metrics throughout dozens and dozens of different scenarios throughout my career. And I'll tell you about the best model that I've come across for communicating risk effectively to company executives and getting them on board with managing it appropriately. So I never intended to work in information security. Uh, when I graduated from college, I actually planned to work in IT project management. I reached out to that hiring manager who told me there was a hiring freeze in IT. He said that I should apply for a job on the information security team. And the rest is history. Uh, a couple of years later, I got a big break. I was chatting with eBay's new CISO. Dave Cullinane had just joined eBay from Washington Mutual. He asked me what I wanted to do when I grow up, and I told him that I wanted to be the CEO of a small to medium-sized company, uh, and he offered me a role as the chief of staff to the global information security team. So a few months after that initial conversation, I found myself preparing a slide deck asking eBay's executives for the largest information security budget in the company's history, and soon I was managing an eight-figure budget. Six months later, Dave says to me, Caroline, We've got the projects, we've got the technology, we've hired a lot of people. Now what we need is the metrics to ensure ongoing investment in the security program. This is not a one-time thing. You don't just do security and then be done with it. So I wanna share a, a little anecdote. Uh, certainly at eBay, application security was and is super important. And naturally we were doing a ton of defect discovery. This involved lots of works, lots of work finding bugs through pen testing and vulnerability scanning. I actually worked with Himanshu. We were all in different roles at that time. And getting information from external security researchers via responsible disclosure. And so being on the security team, it seemed like every week we would go to the developers and say, here is a pile of bugs. It is super important that you fix these right now. And they would basically close the door in our faces. And pretty soon they stopped showing up to our meetings, which is fair maybe, because we were just giving them extra work to do. And so for security people, this sounds familiar, and it's kind of a bummer, because it can feel like you're not really making progress at work. We were finding all sorts of security flaws and vulnerabilities, but that's only half of the solution. In order to actually improve the security posture of software, you've got to find security problems and risk, and you've got to fix or mitigate them. And so at eBay, we teamed up the security team and the development teams to define a measurable objective for our common goal. Conveniently, the CTO had just approached our CISO and asked for a security score for each of the applications on the customer facing websites. This was extremely convenient because his question put us in a position to ask ourselves, well, what should that score be? 
And so we decided that for every customer facing website, it was going to be a defect density score. We wrote down the total number of security bugs for each application and divided it by millions of lines of code to normalize the score across more than a dozen different applications. And so once we had buy in from these executive decision makers, our application security team approached the developers and said, Historically and realistically, what kind of bandwidth do you have to address and remediate security vulnerabilities? And so at that working level, we decided we were going to go for a 20% reduction in the number of vulnerabilities on the customer facing websites over a period of one calendar year. So we tracked and reported the numbers every month to, to the developer teams, to the CTO, to the CISO. By the end of the calendar year, we had achieved our common goal. Now, I want to make a note. The 20% is not a number that security people like. Security people like a number like 100% or 95% or 90%. But the problem is, if we had gone and said, we're going to try and eliminate 100% of the bugs on the website, we probably would have just gotten the same response that we got before. Development teams would say no and stop inviting us to their meetings. They would stop coming to their meetings, and they might even stop reading our emails. I had an opportunity to write a book. This book came out in 2011. And now a decade later, I have more thoughts on security metrics. Uh, and I've actually put those thoughts into a LinkedIn learning course, uh, which I'm happy to share following the session. Um, I'll actually make a link on my LinkedIn that everyone here can click on and watch that uh, new course uh, at no cost. And part of this talk is kind of a preview for that course. So. A little bit after eBay, I found myself at Sigil, which later got acquired by Synopsys. And I got to do BSIM assessments. So for folks who may not be familiar with BSIM, BSIM is a research project. It is a descriptive, not a prescriptive model for software security. So instead of saying, you should do A and B and C, BSIM goes around and asks people, what are you doing? And at any given time, it has more than 100 software security activities that can be observed in the wild. Um, so another, for me, really cool way to do data-driven security. I want to talk to you about why security metrics are so hard. This quote is from a friend of mine who used to be at this financial firm. She had spent seven years trying to do application security metrics with a variety of successes and failures. There was a point when she couldn't even get a meeting with the folks that she was trying to talk to about her program. Because when she had tried to talk to them in the past, they didn't understand what she was talking about. They didn't unfortunately believe that what she had to say had any value. So what I observed is there are often two typical outcomes when people try to do security metrics. Number one, they try to do a traffic-like thing, and it's an oversimplification. Typical outcome number two, there's way too much information overload. I also just want to make a note. I am pretty close to PDX airport, and I'm aware that there is a plane above. So if it's disrupting uh, the audio, my apologies. In our lives, we get bombarded with too much sound, you know, distraction, and with information. And so we can run into this challenge when we're talking about security metrics. We can actually, as security practitioners, sometimes we have a tendency to provide too much information. And that has the possibility of diluting the meaning of what we're trying to convey. And so today I want to talk to you about a model for effective security metrics. First and foremost, security is about protecting value. And in today's modern world, a lot of the things that we value are shifting from the physical realm to the digital realm. And that is why cybersecurity is so important. Now, there are those of us that do cybersecurity, and there are those of us who talk about cybersecurity. And sometimes that's the same person. Sometimes it's different people. Security metrics, I think, is actually about talking about cybersecurity. So... Cybersecurity has many different facets, and I think it can seem complicated, but that it is not impossibly complex. There's a difference between complicated and complex. I think there are actually fundamentals that we as industry professionals can rely on, and we should not allow ourselves to get caught up in the myth that these problems are too hard to solve. Throughout my career, I have had a chance to be on 
two security teams as a practitioner. I've led a global product management team. I've done consulting and now I'm at my first startup. And so this series of diverse experiences has helped me to see that cybersecurity is complicated, but it is not impossibly complex even though NIST 853 is nearly 500 pages long. And even though PCI DSS is more than 130 pages long, and even though the BSIM is more than 100 pages long, and even though the ASVS, rather, the BSIM is more than 100 software security activities, and even though the ASVS is more than 60 pages long. Despite all that, I really think the fundamentals of cybersecurity and application security for that matter, can be boiled down to four basic building blocks. This, number one, govern know your assets. Number two, find, find problems. Number three, fix the problems you find. And number four, prevent them from happening again. And so sometimes it can be complicated. Sometimes the relationship between cybersecurity team members and company executives can be complicated. Every successful business uses metrics to drive action plans and achieve goals. Most businesses have some things in common, which also means that it's easy to define business metrics that can be applied in a standard fashion across many different organizations. For example, many businesses are trying to sell a product or a service, typically for a cost. Often, these types of businesses invest money and resources to convert prospects into newly acquired customers. So that means that standard metrics can be defined for things like a SaaS business. This might include things like customer churn, SQLs, CAC to LTV ratio, because every SaaS business has prospects that are valuable to the marketing and sales teams. Every SaaS business has some customers that stop buying the product at some point. Every SaaS business invests money into acquiring customers and can therefore estimate the lifetime value of those customers. But why aren't there similarly defined metrics for cybersecurity? It's because whereas a business measures in concrete units like dollars and number of customers, cybersecurity is about measuring risk, and that is much more difficult to define. If you think about it, consider the risk management decisions that you make in everyday life. What about the people around you? I'm willing to bet that you make different risk management decisions than some of your friends, family members, and other people in your community. There is a reason why metrics are straightforward in business but not so much when applied to security because most businesses, oops, sorry, just turning that notification off. Thank you for your patience. There is a reason why metrics are straightforward in business, but not when applied to security. Most businesses want more customers, lower customer acquisition costs and higher customer lifetime value, but security controls come at a cost. And that trade-off is where the complexity lies. So if you ride a bicycle and you don't wear a helmet, you might've made that choice because you'd rather spend the money on a new pair of cycling shoes. Or you might've made that choice because you don't like how it feels or how it looks to wear a helmet. These are of course, examples of convenience, ease, or social acceptance cost. Maybe you consider yourself to be a very strong bicyclist and you're only riding around your own backyard. But then again, maybe you're a novice and you're cycling on a busy road. When it comes to cybersecurity, there are often a number of different factors at play. An organization might not patch or update software across all of its systems because they don't have an inventory of all the system owners, or because those systems might respond in an unpredictable way, or because it can't seem to carve out time when it's okay for those systems to be down so that an upgrade can be performed. And so one organization might decide to patch right away, whereas another might choose to wait a month, and yet another might choose to wait a year. So here's how I think you could address these things. You could start with risk management objectives. This is something that I talked about with Sammy Miguez years ago. What are your goals? How can you get on the same page with regards to goals for a cybersecurity and application security program as your company executives? You can agree that good software helps the business, and bad software hurts the business. Therefore, we want to make good software and we want to fix bad software or we wanna prevent bad software from being built in the first place. So you can start there. You can ask questions about achieving that goal. Good software, good, bad software, bad. You can start on the same page. You can ask questions. You can answer those questions with data. 
part of this is about talking to people about security, people who are not experts in security, they're not expected to be experts in security, in a way that conveys to them, I have a plan. Will you go with my plan? If there's a problem with the plan, I'll let you know and I'll keep you updated on where we are with the plan. I need you to know that I have a plan and I need you to get on board. So we can agree that good software is good for business, bad software is bad for business. Let's go one more level down. So at this stage, you're about to have a risk tolerance discussion with key stakeholders in your organization. At this point, you should have done your homework. You understand how your organization creates value and you're ready to propose a strategy for protecting that value. You'll also need to present a plan and a budget. And so what's the best way to go about doing this? I like to use this approach that I call risk management objectives. So I'm gonna share these with you, there's seven. And along with each risk management objective, I will also suggest a few questions that you can use to determine if it's relevant to your business operations and security posture. Risk management objectives. Okay, here we go. Number one, use cybersecurity as a competitive differentiator. How much do your customers care about security? Because if it's a lot, then you should definitely be using it as something to hand, help you stand out from the competition. Do your customers expect security to be a core part of your business? Because if it's a clear expectation, then it might also be a clear competitive advantage. Would your customers buy your product instead of another one because of better security? If they would, then a strong security posture is something to talk up early and often. Risk management objective number two, comply with a regulatory requirement, contractual obligation, or industry standard. Which of these things apply to your business? If those include security standards, then it's a clear opportunity for you to use it as a way to get folks on board with your security plan. Risk management objective number three, achieve a defensible level of due care. What does due care mean in the context of your business? Does it mean that you keep all of your software up to date and apply patches regularly or that you use two-factor authentication wherever possible? Find out what due care means in your business environment and then use it to promote strong security practices. Okay, here we start to get into the ones that I get really excited about. Risk management objective number four, prevent the same cybersecurity problems from happening over and over again. Is your organization mature enough to know if the same types of issues keep showing up? Do you have reliable defect discovery processes in place? And are the findings from those being tracked and reported? Because if they are, then you might use this as an opportunity to use that data to make a case for remediating the problems more consistently. Alternatively, are you finding about finding out about security incidents from customers or from independent researchers, because if you're learning more about security issues from externally than from internally, your program may not be mature enough to focus on this particular risk management objective. Number five, reduce the probability that malicious attackers can stop critical applications and systems from functioning. I love this one because I feel like if you go and talk to a company executive and you say, hey, company executive, I think we should try and reduce the probability that malicious attackers can stop critical systems and applications from functioning. It's pretty easy for folks to get on board with that. Uh, but similar questions. Do you actually know and understand which systems and processes are critical to your organization? Because if you do, you can create a list of critical assets and use it to manage security activity. Do you have defect discovery processes? If this information is organized and you can associate vulnerability information with specific assets and track remediation status, then this might be a good choice. Do you know what type of malicious attacker is likely to target your organization? Because different threat actors may display different types of behavior and you can use this information to craft your strategy accordingly. All right, we've got two more. Number six, require fixes for security bugs for which well-known attacks exist. Again, I just love this scenario, right? Because you walk into the room with your important security stakeholder and you say, hey, I think we should require fixes for security bugs for which well-known attacks exist. And similarly, this works best if you have consistent and repeatable defect discovery processes, if you have effective tracking and reporting. Uh, and number seven, achieve a comparable level of cybersecurity to peers and or competition. So how much does your company strategy focus on competitive analysis? If there's a lot of focus, 
then this might be an effective risk management objective to use in your environment. In fact, when I was at eBay and Dave Cullinane was asking eBay's executives for a lot of money compared to what they used to spend prior to that time, he called up CISO friends at other organizations that were similar-ish and said, how much money are they giving you? Uh, so benchmarking, uh, of course, uh, can, be, can be useful for these conversations. What can you find out about the level of cybersecurity investment at companies that are similar to yours in terms of size, number of customers, industry vertical, et cetera? This type of benchmark data can maybe help you convince your executive stakeholders to make similar investments if they want to keep up. Whew. All right, we got five minutes. I have like so much more to say than in five minutes. So I'm just thinking to myself, what are the things we're going to focus on? Let's talk about a couple of breaches. Let's talk about 2017, Equifax breach. More than 140 million people affected, a widely accepted theory that the attackers were state-sponsored spies from China, a CEO who stepped down three weeks after the breach became public, $1.4 billion to clean up the mess, and an FTC settlement. How did this breach happen? It was not because of a super sophisticated zero-day technical issue. It was because some software was found to be vulnerable, a patch was made available, and Equifax did not deploy the patch. This was not a crazy technical problem that lacked the solution. The technical solution was available. This was a lack of people and process innovation. Last year, we found out that threat actors managed to plant malware and some monitoring software, which happened to be in use by some hundreds of organizations. When the news first broke, the breach was described as a highly sophisticated, targeted, and manual supply chain attack by an outside nation state, which sounds really intense, and it is. But when you draw back the curtain, maybe, just maybe, it seems that they had used the password SolarWinds123 to protect the company's update server, in which case it's no wonder malicious threat actors took advantage and planted some malware. This is unfortunately a simple security misconfiguration. Four minutes left. We're gonna talk about the state of pen testing, if I can get my slides to play along. Okay, so I work for Cobalt. We are a pen test as a service company. We have a lot of data, we publish that data. And in this year's state of pen testing report, we reported that security misconfiguration was the number one most commonly identified vulnerability type found across Cobalt pen test for the fourth year in a row. <laughs> oh. Uh, as a pen test provider, we see firsthand how vulnerabilities make it into software and systems that handle terabytes of sensitive information. And so we publish our annual state of pen test report to shed light on what those vulnerabilities are and to identify the trends and the hazards that impact our community. We collect the data through our PTAS platform, which connects security teams with a thoroughly vetted community of pen testers to examine their systems and software. And so this year, we looked at data from over six, 1,600 pen tests that we did in 2020. And the most interesting trend is that our customers have been struggling with the same top five vulnerabilities for four years in a row, despite the fact that they are things that are well known to the industry. Teams still struggle to effectively remove and prevent issues like service security misconfiguration and cross-site scripting from their environment. And to understand why that was, we surveyed more than 600 companies, not all Cobalt customers, to learn how they pursue secure development, how they pen test and remediate vulnerabilities, and where there is room for process improvements for both internal security teams and security vendors. I think there's another plan ahead, overhead. And so what we found was a super interesting mixture of pain points, workflow challenges, and suggestions on how pen testing can evolve as a layer of defense that can actually help validate the effectiveness of all the controls that came before it. We have two minutes. I am not gonna talk about all the takeaways. This report is available. I welcome you to check it out at your convenience. I also wanna tell you about this LinkedIn learning course that I did. Uh, again, I'm gonna share it on my LinkedIn profile. And if you click on that link, you'll be able to watch it for free. And that's it. I, I appreciate so much uh, you joining me today uh, and, and listening me share some of my thoughts on security metrics. And I would love to get in touch. Here's my email. Here's my LinkedIn. Uh, thank you so much. And happy 20th birthday, OWASP.